Shall I start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sharat and Dr. Rita. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome all of you to this uh, next session and next lecture lecture on uh, the block on block one that is about ecology, environment, and sustainability. I am sure the previous lecture was clear to all of you. And if you have any questions, you can write to your coordinators and they can send these questions to me. Or you can also type in the chat box and I will take a note. And once I finish, uh, I can share uh, my answers or we can have a discussion also. So this, uh, today we'll be talking about energy balance principle. I am sure many of you are very, uh, uh, much aware about some of these principles, uh, the law of thermodynamics, but how they are applicable to ecology, environment, and economics. That is today. That is what today we are going to discuss about. And this unit is basically composed of uh, different uh, topics and subheadings. So I'll give you a brief uh, glimpse of what is there. So in this chapter structure. We'll be talking about what uh, energy dynamics is with reference to ecology and environment. We'll be also talking about in detail about law of thermodynamics with special reference to economy and environment. So first and second law of the thermodynamics. We'll also be talking about third law of thermodynamics and zeroth law of thermodynamics and the concept of entropy. Now this is one interesting part in environment uh, and we will be taking it in detail. We'll also be talking about characterization of various abiotic and bio, biotic resources and their relevance with reference to thermodynamics and ecology and env environment. We will also be talking about the important subheading and topic of absolute scarcity and how it influences and impacts sustainability. And then finally, we'll be talking about how to take uh, these thermodynamic laws and their considerations in our economic analysis. So again, like previous chapter, previous unit, uh, uh, where we discussed uh, about uh, the historical evolution of economic theories over the time period and how they have uh, influenced environmental context. So in the similar direction, the second uh, unit is going to give you more understanding on energy, uh, the law of thermodynamics and how it influences and impacts economic context. Now, when we talk about uh, our biophysical systems uh, and our bio, biosphere, we all know that there is a very, very uh, inherent and strong connection between the human economy, economy and natural environment. Now, you can uh, see this in context of how development has been taking place. In previous lecture, we talked about uh, GDP, the gross domestic product that has been uh, developed as an indicator and criteria for development and especially economic development. Then we also talked about how it is a false criteria because the gross natural product should be the criteria for economic development because most of our uh, economic development is based on natural resources. And if you talk about the, our dependency or the dependency of human economy on natural environment or natural ecosystem, it is very, very significant. And that is very clear even in the present context. You see, uh, somebody has his mic open. So please keep yourself on mute unless and until you have something important to add or ask me a question. So this, uh, uh, so this uh, also gives you an understanding that over the time period, historically, whatever development has taken place is actually on the cost of natural resources. And still, if you see and study climate change, you talk about planetary boundaries, where climate change is one of the things. You talk about biogeochemical cycles that are getting disturbed. You talk about biodiversity dis disturbance and so many other related aspects, even ozone layer you will know that this development has come at the cost of nature, natural resources, and natural environment. Now, nature provides energy, material, and ecosystem services. 
and those who have little bit background or uh, energy and material the mass balance our entire planet runs on mass balance principles so there is uh, energy that comes on earth so that energy the source of energy for this planet is sun and then we have different materials that develop because of this energy for example your natural resources especially your trees your plants your oceanic uh, flora and fauna your uh, your fresh water flora and fauna they are all dependent on the energy that is coming from sun and these all materials these are biotic and abiotic component actually combine together and give you diverse ecosystem services or nature's contribution to people that are important to sustain human life and also to expand economic output now that is very clear that entire uh, economy is dependent on natural environment and this economic development is based on the mass balance or mass balance theories that are uh, taking place and that are running this entire ecosystem until recently what we were thinking and most of the countries were thinking that these resources and our services are very uh, infinite but if we see this standard models of economic production even this a figure where i'm talking about biophysical economics you will see that uh, there is a raw material uh, that gives you low that has low entropy mass and energy so i will be talking about all these terms later in my uh, discussion so you don't have to actually worry about what these are and then so these are the sources from where these raw materials mass and energy is coming up and this is supporting our economic subsystem how our development is taking place how our human well being is taken care of and later on there is a sink function the residuals the pollutants the leftovers the waste the hazardous waste that all lead to uh, the sink function of this biophysical system that is the result of economic development but later on it actually leads to a lot of problems to this biophysical system so this is a basic about uh, how this chapter starts and in this uh, unit we are going to trace the evolution of these biophysical models especially how these ma mass balance theories are working in context of uh, economic development based on environment and we will be looking up uh, uh, towards the formulation of law of thermodynamics and these law as many of you might be aware of and many of you might have read during your uh, school times or your college times that these were formulated during early 19th century and in this unit we will be talking about the development of biophysical theory and how it contributes to our current ecological economics aspects so this is what uh, that uh, is a big background that i have given you to understand what we are going to talk about today in this long lecture so uh, i am sure many of you have not read this chapter but those who have read this chapter so the expectation of uh, through by reading and understanding this chapter is that you are able to explain the influence of laws of thermodynamics the concept of entropy and entropy is more of a randomness the theory of randomness on economics and thought in general in emergence of ecological economics how your thermodynamics how your concept of entropy that's a important part of your third law of thermodynamics is going to contribute to economical concept now we will also be looking to stock flow and fund service resources and that's a important thing somebody uh, who is taking notes may definitely and should definitely put these important terms uh, in mind when they want to explore further the ecological economic concepts and then we will also be underlining the linkages between thermodynamics relative and absolute scarcity and sustainability now how it relates to absolute scarcity and sustainability is another important aspect of this unit now uh, when i talk about economy environment linkages one of these figure is by nayak and mishra that you find in your textbooks and there is this important and another uh, two diagrams by not and rots who have recently published this uh, in journal of environmental uh, economics now this is a very important reference and this says that economy constitutes of economic agents so economy itself is composed of different agents and these agents are the producers the consumers 
and the intermediary institutions between these two agents. For example, I'll give you a very uh, common example. If you talk about somebody collecting, uh, somebody growing vegetables in the market or recently now in the market, wheat is coming or any other grain is coming. So these cereals are grown by somebody. So who are the producers? So the farmers are the producers. Then who are the consumers? Us, who are the consumers? Those who are going to buy it from the market. And there are several middlemen also, an intermediary institution who actually built these uh, connections between producers and consumers. And these intermediary institutions can be the market, it can be, develop, uh, be the government who have different policies or different ways, different mandis that connect the producers with the consumer. So this is how the economy runs in the current context. And when we talk, of, and you can see the same thing in this, uh, in these diagrams, and the environment constitutes of the biosphere. So we have the biosphere, we have the atmosphere, the aerial atmosphere, and the geosphere, the geosphere, the underground subsurface, uh, uh, and how geological, uh, biogeochemical cycles are running. So they all constitute this entire environment. The activities of economic agents and economic incentives that come because of exploration of resources or harvesting of resources are going to lead to environmental pollution and degradation of natural resources. Now here, one thing is very important to mention. This exploitation, whenever it crosses its, its threshold, whenever it is beyond sustainable limits, it's going to enhance pollution. It is going to enhance degradation of natural resources. For example, during the COVID times, we all needed immunity, uh, immunity boosters like Giloy, aloe vera, and so many other things. So wherever they were available in natural environment, they were going to be exploited beyond a sustainable lim limit. And that was one of the reasons that many of the natural pockets were degraded very severely. And the second example is uh, using the benefit of uh, these incentives, for example, using fossil fuel to run a lot of vehicles around. So this also leads to a lot of uh, uh, vehicular emissions and a lot of uh, air pollution. So whenever your economic agents and economic incentives are going to be fully dependent or largely unsustainably or uh, dependent on exploitation of resources, be fossil fuels or be natural resources, they're going to enhance and uh, lead to unsustainable development. Now, if there was no economy in context, for example, if we assume a world, if we assume a world where there was uh, no market, you see that there was no market. And if you go back to the times when people were living without market, so most of these exchanges were going on in barter system. You were giving something and in return, you were finding something else. So if the market was not existing, most of these research questions were actually going to only chemist or biologist because because economic exists because economic exists and that's why we need to have policies and these policies are for regulating extraction for regulating consumption of resources so that we can have sustainable development so this is one of the important economic environment linkages and that we need to understand now for example if we take this uh, a material balance approach, as I mentioned, uh, even our entire planet runs on mass balance theory. So there is uh, energy, there is energy from sun that is coming on earth. Then you have producers, producers are mostly plants. So when energy comes, photosynthesis happens. And when photosynthesis happens, biomass growth takes place, growth of plants takes place. And this growth is further harvested by people for various purposes, uh, for various uh, provisioning benefits. Uh, for example, it can be food, it can be timber, it can be fuel wood, it can be fodder, it can be NTFP, it can be anything that is coming directly from these resources. Fishes in the ocean are again another uh, producers, sorry, consumers. So this, uh, the entire food chain runs on a mass balance theory. And if we try to understand it with the economic perspective, we understand that these producers are going to help uh, these consumers have these benefit of goods to have better quality of life. Now, now, again, there is a certain amount of 
so there is uh, and you also know that whenever flow of energy takes place in a food chain or in a food web energy depletes at every interval for example from producers to consumer certain amount of energy decreases from first consumer to second consumer to tertiary consumer again the energy depletes so the same phenomena has been explained in this uh, diagram so this so this energy goes decreasing at, at every consumer interval and whenever there are residuals or there is certain amount of energy that goes back to the environment that is discharged that is released so there is no so there is this energy that is discharged back to the environment so this is the approach that takes place in the environment and this is will be the same thing that we'll be discussing today how mass uh, material balance approach takes place in the environment now ecology of thermodynamics is important to understand because both ecology and in, in economics are important constituent of a sustainable society to address sustainability and to have and ensure human well-being of society we need to understand the ecology of thermodynamics and also economics and technology aspect because when we have economics and technology we will have also alternatives where we can reduce pressure on natural ecosystem where we can find substitutes of natural ecosystem and we can ensure that this harvesting is sustainable because market also runs on resources whenever you know there is a a crisis or whenever there is a demand of certain resource suddenly the price also rises when there is less demand the prices are not that high so in that same phenomena we need to understand this a uh, concept of uh, economics its importance technology its importance ecology and thermodynamics and its importance for societal well being and sustainability now as i mentioned that a uh, continued extraction of resources also constrains the availability of resources for further use for example we know that fossil fuel is depleting presently and it has been forecasted from several decades that we don't have infinite resources of fossil fuel and you all are will be convinced that uh, over the time period fossil fuel prices are increasing and this is one of the reasons also to showcase that though we have a lot of demand we have finite resource of fossil fuel for finite resource of uh, uh coal so that also limits the size of the economy for example if you remember the glasgow cop that happened last year it was all based on coal based economic development where everybody has to promise that by 2030 2050 we have to be net zero so when i say net zero that means our economic development should not be based on coal and fossil fuel because that is considered not to be a clean source of energy and energy is important to run this entire economic development so that also gives you a clear indication that our resources are finite and now we need to switch to technological interventions to identify resources that are more self sustainable resources that are renewable for example your solar energy or wind energy or hydrogen energy and so on and so forth so this is how the economic development is taking place where right now humanity is at a at, at a junction where we need to shift from polluting energy or unclean energy to a more cleaner sources of energy so this uh, same phenomena has been discussed by diverse uh, different laws of thermodynamics and it's the same thing that uh, i want to show you here that your economic development this box of economic system this square of economic system how small and how big it is it 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 will decide that how much of energy we are consuming and how much of waste we are producing because whenever solar energy or energy enters the planet it has high grade of energy high grade of thermal energy but whenever waste emulation assimilation happens whenever degradation happens the the um, the the quality of energy that is released is of low growth thermal energy but at the same time it is very far harmful for the earth's biosphere so your driver your driving factor of this entire 
extraction, consumption pattern, uh, consumerism is uh, mostly related to the box of economic system. Higher the economic growth, higher is the consumption of such energy. For example, if you see uh, the Western world, United States of America, Europe, even countries in Asia like Japan or countries in Middle East, they all are the countries that are facing and having high economic development, but at the same time, their consumption pattern, their energy consumption patterns are quite high. So you can see economic growth is also related with high consumption of energy patterns. And if you take the scenario of India, you will understand that India right now has this huge uh, compulsion of climate justice. So when we talk about climate justice, we need to ensure that everybody gets electricity. When I say electricity, I mean energy. And this energy is going to lead to development in the areas where development has still not reached. So this is the entire uh, concept, context, and importance of energy with the environment. Now, when I talk about thermodynamics, you all know uh, is the area of study of energy. And we all know that uh, energy cannot be created. It cannot be completely lost. It can only be converted from one type of energy to another type of energy. And this energy is, conversion is basically the ability of energy to do and or to get some work done. So uh, uh, if you see this system, there is a system has a boundary and energy comes in, energy comes out. There is a mass that is uh, generated because of this energy and there is a certain mass that comes out. So there is uh, some part of energy that gets lost as a mass out. There is some part of energy that is uh, developed when energy comes in. So it's very clear that energy gets transformed from one one kind of energy to another part kind of energy, be it electrical energy or mechanical energy or any other kind of energy that has the ability to get the work done. Now, uh, this all uh, concepts were generated uh, during the 19th century and was the same time when industrial revolution was taking place. And it was also the time when economic growth uh, was uh, I mean, there was a first time when economic growth was directly proportional to industrial development. And this was the first initial time when we actually started thinking and talking about economy and environment connection and industrial and uh, development context in real terms. Now, if you see the types of uh, thermodynamic system, thermo means uh, thermal, energy or heat, as you can uh, understand better. Dynamic, it's a dynamic entity. It's never in, a con uh, never in a static phase. It's always in a dynamic phase. Energy has this tendency to be in a dynamic phase and it can transform from one kind of energy to another kind of energy. Now, again, we have uh, three kinds of systems. We have closed systems where energy can come in from the surrounding and energy can get out also so and then there are open systems where there are in the system boundaries there are spaces from where there is a clear transfusion of mass inside and outside and energy can also come and leave whereas in closed system energy can come in but mass cannot come in and then there is an isolated system where no energy and mass transfer takes place. So these are three important dynamic thermodynamic system, the closed one, the open system, and the isolated system that you need to understand. Now, uh, in a very, very uh, initial level, I just want to give you a cursory overview of laws of thermodynamics. The one is zeroth law, temperature. So if uh, it says that if two systems are in equilibrium, with the third system in thermal equilibrium, there will be thermal equilibrium with each other. For example, uh, there are two systems that are having similar kind of uh, uh, similar kind of equilibrium, along with the third system that is in thermal equilibrium. So they all three will be in thermal equilibrium. So this was the zero law about the temperature, and there was the first law that talks about conservation of energy and energy only change its form it can be neither created nor destroyed. So total energy will always be the same. The only thing is it will 
change its uh, the, the the kind or the form that it is now second law says that entropy of an isolated system always increases now entropy here means randomness of molecules uh, every particle every atom in this planet in this environment has this tendency to achieve entropy to achieve a state of randomness so for example if you see the hot system the temperature is high there is a lot of randomness and you see another system that is cold so there is molecules are more in a, a strict binding condition they are more closer they are more arranged in a particular space but when you keep both these system together you will see that suddenly your whole thing will also start getting hotter it will start getting melted it will start melting so this also shows that uh, if there is a isolist uh, if there is a system where two of kinds of these uh, uh, isolated systems are kept together so the one that has low temperature or one that has low entropy will always increase its entropy getting influence with the other system now third law says that entropy of the system approaches a constant as temperature approaches absolute zero now this is a very hypothetical situation where we say that entropy now absolute zero temperature is around uh, minus 273 degree cent uh, degree centigrade now this is the absolute zero temperature beyond that there is no zero uh, no cold temperature so whenever there is absolute zero temperature the entropy of a system is also zero that means this is the state when there will be no randomness all the molecules will be strictly closely associated with each other now this is an important junction of understanding how at sub zero level the laws of thermodynamics act now coming back to the first uh, law of thermodynamics that says energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed it is only that uh, uh, it can be changed one form to another so in other words it also says that change in the internal energy of a closed system is equal to the heat added to the system minus the work done by the system for example uh, for example these uh, important examples are shown where ice cream is given to a boy so he eats so he uh, enjoys the ice cream so the energy now gets transformed the calories in uh, ice cream uh, are going to be transformed into the calorific or energy in the boy's body and this he uses to run a cycle so now the calorific energy the heat the energy is getting transformed into the kinetic energy so in this way the energy transformation takes place similarly when we eat food this food gets transformed into kinetic energy to do different kinds of activities so the energy in the atmosphere the energy on this planet is uh, at, at one particular form level but it can only transform and it can only change its form now second example is again that i uh, told you earlier that light energy uh, uses uh, this chemical energy to fix and that is how uh, carbohydrates and different uh, sugar forms are developed in plant bodies and you will be amazed to understand that it the simplest thing that we see in the atmosphere how plants are fixing and doing this photosynthesis and making energy for themselves growing making biomass it is very very tough to actually do the similar kind of experiment in the in in uh, in the in the laboratories where you have these huge amount of energy that comes from sun and make food by using this energy of sun in the presence of water and uh, carbon dioxide in uh, in a laboratory so you can, you may be amazed to see the kind of energy transformation takes place in the environment silently is one of the spectacular things of how our nature works now because the system operates in the real world some energy always escapes into the outside world it is very clear whenever even energy is fixed when the producer fixes energy when consumer the first consumer or herbivore uses this energy there is certainly some amount of energy that is not getting transformed that will be escaped back into the environment and 
that will lead to the both inefficiency of the second law which was generated to cover the so called flaw in the first law so the second law where it was said that entropy of an isolated system always increases it no is not true in the in this case so uh, because in real time conditions when physics was written you all know that it was written in a vacuum every experiment everything was true in vacuum but in real time conditions there are escape in mass there is also escape in energy so that is not very true uh, in the case of even the first law of thermodynamic even the transformation of energy is not 100% there is certain amount of energy that will escape in the environment now second law of thermodynamics says that it, it is impossible to obtain a process where the unique effect is the subtraction of a positive heat from a reservoir and positive uh, and production of a positive work so this says second law says uh uh that the amount of energy that we give to a system will not go in 100% production of work as i mentioned in the previous slide there will be some energy that will escape out so this escape of energy is basically entropy and this is the randomness the chaos as it moves away from its resource in this sense energy or heat cannot flow from a colder body to a hotter body for example here in this picture we show that if we have one part of this block very hot and other very cold there will not be 100% heat flow there will be certainly some amount of heat that will be escaping uh, to the environment one cannot keep a continual flow of heat to work without energy adding energy to the system in machine terms we can also say that if we add energy to get more work the ratio of heat to work will never be equal to 100 that means there will be a certain amount of energy that will be escaped so where is this energy going so to understand this escape of energy and why there is whenever we give this heat to any system why not there is 100% conversion of energy to the another form of whatever work we are trying to do so for correction of this there was this third law of thermodynamics and this talks about entropy the randomness so if we increase temperature uh, if increase temperature we all know that randomness in molecule increases so this randomness and chaos in uh, i mean increasing distance and uh, having a random shape is basically entropy then the opposite should be true if the third law says that if we increase temperature that increase randomness it is also possible to decrease the temperature and to reach uh, entropy that is sub zero so this says this law says that if we are increasing the temperature we are increasing the entropy so this also means that if we reduce the temperature we will reduce the entropy so what is what does it mean that if entropy is zero so as i mentioned third law of thermodynamics says that entropy can only be zero when we cool a system to sub zero de level so sub zero level is uh, minus 273 degree centigrade now it says that all process sees at temperature absolute zero there is no temperature below this minus 273 degree centigrade at this temperature all the molecules sees their in movement and sees producing kinetic energy so at this particular sub zero temperature there will be no kinetic energy left in this system there will be no energy left in the system so the third law of thermodynamics says the value of entropy of a completely pure crystalline substance is zero at absolute sub zero temperature so this also means that in this environment on this planet it is very tough to find situations where there will be zero kinetic energy where there will be no energy so even if you see ice if you because your ice is not being frozen at minus 273 degree centigrade so there will be a certain amount of kinetic energy in that case also so this also uh, gives you some understanding and some concluding remarks that while your first law establishes the material balance where energy cannot be transfer uh, cannot be created or destroyed it can only be transferred and this means that first law establishes the material balance 
The second law highlights the impossibility of getting the usable energy from unusable energy. So if I go back to second law of thermodynamics, that shows that says that if there are two different system, they will come in equilibrium because of heat exchange. But this also says that in the case where there are, is a wood and there is a ash and they, all, they both are kept uh, close to each other, it is uh, impossible to get the usable and I mean, it is impossible to get energy. You can get energy from the wood, but you cannot reverse back this energy from ash. So ash is basically the, 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 the remaining part or the part where there is no possibility of getting energy. I hope this is clear to all of you so far. And uh, now we're going to talk about high entropy matter energy. Now, this might look tough to some of you, but uh, this is a uh, uh, little relevant in context if you want to build your economic understanding on how mass energy transfer takes place. And I must also assure you those who are interested in taking up research in future that this aspect of mass energy balance is very relevant even a lot of ecological experiment. Now, thermodynamic entropy is a measure of inability of system energy to perform work. So there is a, there is a situation where you don't get any work done, uh, but at the same time, zero energy situation uh, is very, very hard to find on this planet. Uh, and there is this, uh, if you see these examples, there are two important examples, and this is also in your book. Here you can find that uh, uh, there is one, this hourglass uh, of universe where on the upside of this uh, hourglass is sun that gives you energy, and below is earth that is isolated system, more or less isolated system. So there is fixed flow of solar energy. Whereas if you see this, second hourglass, that is a terrestrial hourglass or closed system, you know there is fixed stock of mineral and fossil fuel that is in low entropy. The moment you start using it and the moment it starts coming out of the waste is in high entropy. So if there is a adjustable flow rate of consumption, it is, uh, it is sure that we will get less waste material. But if we constantly use it below the thresholds that we have used so far, it's very clear that we will get high entropy. The energy that is stored in fossil fuel is more or less in less entropy. And now when it gets emitted out in the way of vehicular emission or industrial emission or greenhouse gases, this is going to affect the entire, entire planet. Now, similarly here it is uh, shown that uh, if there is solar stock and there is terrestrial stock, your terrestrial stock, okay, you can assume your trees that have the biomass that is very, have, that's very condensed and is having low entropy. The moment you start extracting these trees, removing the resources, there is a stage when you have more waste material generated, be in liquid stage or be in gaseous stage, it leads to high entropy. So uh, the entropy of an isolated system increases its available in energy uh, or exenergy decreases. That is in the sand in the chamber, upper chamber, as I showed you, but in real time condition, uh, wherever in terrestrial ecosystem, whenever we increase the entropy, it doesn't increase its energy. It actually reduces its energy that is of no significant use for human well-being. So again, repetition and uh, mem uh, remembering a few points that we discussed uh, and we, uh, we saw in last few slides, the first law of thermodynamics is about conversion of uh, conservation of energy. We can use this energy to determine the amount of energy in a system and how much it gets lost as waste of heat and efficiency of the system. Now, second law of thermodynamics is about disorder in the universe. And in universe, everything, every particle has this tendency to reach, to achieve maximum randomness. As the disorder in the universe increases, the energy is transformed into 
less usable form. And that's very clear when you burn fossil fuel, when you burn coal. So you are increasing the disorderness, you are increasing the entropy, and thus the efficiency of any process will always be less than 100% because your certain amount of energy is getting escaped as entropy. Now, the third law of thermodynamics, as I mentioned, that all molecular activities should uh, achieve absolute zero by minus 273 degrees centigrade or zero degree Kelvin. Since temperature is the measure of movement, there can be no temperature lower than absolute zero. And that is also shared, uh, showed that we will not have any, uh, I mean, we will, it's very hard to find a stage where there will be there will be no energy in a system uh, on this planet. At this temperature, it is said, a perfect crystal will have no disorder. It will have, uh, it ha will have very low entropy. Now, entropy has been a very important part of this discussion. And in previous uh, slides, we have talked about thermodynamics. Now we come to the concept of entropy. Why entropy is so important? One thing is very clear that you have now this understanding that all the resources, be it plants, uh, be it coal or fossil fuel, from where we get uh, highest amount of energy, they all have high entropy. Sorry, they have low entropy because their molecules are packed. But the moment we start extracting them, there is a high entropy energy getting released that is of no better use but at the same time, if we use it sustainably, there are chances that this high entropy stages are achieved at a very sustainable stage. Now, examples are, uh, as I gave you, growing and blooming of a flower as a technical process, burning of fossil fuel, as I mentioned, as a high entropy concept. And hence, entropy has been coined as in the concept of thermodynamics as a, as a fact to cap as a, as a fact of understanding nature. So at the same time, entropy also allows you to make a quantitative statement about efficiency of energetic and material transformation. For example, this much of material of coal, for example, this much of coal was burned and this much of energy was released. This much of, uh, so how this material transformation takes place or how this energy transformation takes place. This is all that you can define with the uh, concept of entropy. Now, uh, this also means there is a tendency in nature to proceed in a uh, As I mentioned in previous slide also, that every particle in nature wants to achieve randomness. Uh, even if, if you see our bodies right from the birth to the end, they achieve a state where there is uh, highest randomness. So even our biotic uh, biotic factors or even our own human bodies are moving towards the tendency of nature of achieving the highest randomness. So a random nature of a system is uh, irregular. Uh, I mean, a random system is uh, irregular arrangement of its parts. For example, if you see low randomness, that means a, a definite shape, a definite size. Uh, so there is all the molecules are packed and slowly these start reaching a shape where low entropy, high entropy conditions are on the way. So this randomness is called entropy. And we can also say that this is basically a tendency of to measure chaos or disorder. Uh, entropy is, uh, is, uh, can, be defined, can be presented by capital S in italics. And it can be defined in simple qualitative way as a measure of the degree of randomness of the particle, such as uh, a molecule in a system. Now, uh, entropy is also used as a measure of unusable energy in a closed system. So this is also very clear. Whenever we burn coal and we release greenhouse gases as emissions, so these are the energies basically that were not used in a very constructive or in a positive workforce. And as these energies that are unusable energy increases, the usable energy decreases by the same amount. Because as it was mentioned in the first law, uh, you cannot create or destroy energy. You can only uh, transform energy from one form to another. So that means that 
uh, if there is a lot of uh, entropy in a closed system, and as it increases, the amount of uh, the good amount of usable energy is also reduced. And this is how it is also mentioned that energy retreats from its source and generally in the form of unusable energy. Whenever energy escapes from any system, it mostly is in the form of unused system, unused or unusable energy. Now, there was this Carnot cycle, but before I take Carnot cycle, I would like to ask you if you have any specific questions with this. Any questions? Okay. So we will go back, but uh, I'll just take a 30 second back, uh, break to get some water. Okay, so I am back and um, we can start back. So, so far we studied uh, the energy, environment, economic interlinkages. We also got an overview of thermodynamics. We also got an overview on different laws of thermodynamics. We had a basic understanding on what entropy is. So actually you can relate it uh, with the, the ongoing economic development context. And I'm going to add a few more important things that will be relevant to understand more. Uh, so this is Carnot cycle. It is a idealized model of a heat engine which performs mechanical work through the flow of heat from a hot reservoir at a temperature that is temperature H to a temperature, lower temperature reservoir that has a temperature uh, TL. So if you see, uh, this has uh, different stages from isothermal expansion to adiabatic expansion. So I'm sure you understand a bit of what uh, isothermal and adiabatic expansion are, giving you a more uh, a precise overview of what four stages of this Carnot cycle are for understanding more about thermodynamic uh, functioning of ecology and environment. So in uh, first stage, that is stage one, the isometric expansion takes place. And in isometric expansion, when the system is heated, the gas becomes larger. And this becomes larger because of increase in volume. And the volume increase also means increase in increase in entropy of the system. So whenever we give energy to any system, it has an isometric expansion, expansion because of uh, increase in entropy, increase in volume. And then there is the second expansion that is called as isotonic expansion. The gas expands further due to dark energy. While percent fat remains the milk fat remains constant. The, 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 the constant, there is a per certain amount that remains constant. And then there is isopropyl, con, uh, uh, this uh, isopropyl compression. When inflation is held constant, the gas contracts due to tightening interest rate. Now this is a uh, economic uh, explanation of this Carnot cycle. And when there is the adiabatic expansion, decline and fall, the gas diminishes and goes into the west while remaining Galadriel completing the cycle. So this expansion is basically showing you that when you give energy to any system, first uh, isothermal expansion takes place, then volume increases, and then further volume exp expanses, uh, expansion takes by adiabatic expansion. And then later on, this compression starts taking place. When your temperature starts lowering, the compression starts taking place and isothermal compression takes place. And further, it comes back in the state by following again, adiabatic compression. So now uh, this is a very important uh, in 
important uh, cycle to understand how this uh, energy transfer happens in closed systems. So the entropy law states that with every transformation, isolated system loses parts of ability to perform useful mechanical work. As, as, you, as you saw that after a certain time, uh, the isolated Related system doesn't have further energy to go for further expansion. So it starts coming back and it also loses its uh, useful function of doing productive work. And as the system approaches thermodynamic equilibrium over time, its entropy will increase until it reaches maximum position. In this case also, you see it will reach a position where it is uh, having the maximum energy and then it will start coming back to uh, the final stage of maximum entropy, the system's potential for doing any kind of work is zero. As far as uh, universe and planet is concerned, we can describe our system also as an isolated system. Its final state is basically a state of maximum entropy and zero potential for work, a state described as heat death. Now, this is a similar stage that we can uh, understand with uh, greenhouse gas emissions where you are using the material uh, and energy of uh, low entropy conditions of coal, fossil fuels, or trees. And while burning them, you are reaching a stage of maximum entropy where the energy of the planet that is being released out is actually of no good use. And this is basically known as heat death condition. Now, it's also important to uh, understand that uh, in most of these uh, IPCC discussions, we talk about carbon budgeting. So that also means that we have a certain threshold till when we can actually release or emit more of this carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. If we go beyond this, our temperature will rise. In the same condition, the carbon budget of our planet is uh, only for next seven to 11 years. So that means if we go beyond that, we're already talking about 1.5 degrees centigrade, but if we go beyond that, it will be no useful energy. It will only be harmful for the planet and there will be more temperature increases. And if you see in present time, we're talking about 2.7 to 3 degree increase through this. Now, there are very few important uh, economists who were discussed uh, who discussed some important points. One of them was Kenneth Golding, who was the first one to highlight the relevance of the law of thermodynamics to economics. And his seminal work was carried out in 1966, which was later popularized by Nicholas George Rogen. And I will be talking about this next person in a forthcoming slide. Now, if you see this interaction of the environment and you see the complexity of our system, so uh, your control system starts from uh, mechanical systems to self-regulating system, and then you have biological systems and then social systems. So your mechanical and self-regulating systems are basically your biogeochemical cycles and your geosphere. And as you start moving from cell, plant, animal, and human being, you know these are the biological systems, and this is the hierarchy of complexity that was given by Bolding. And this was uh, the, the energy, the energy transfer that takes place and regulates the entire biogeochemical and geosphere, biosphere, and atmosphere cycle. And then at the fourth level was social system or social organization that basically uses this complexity of the system to get the maximum well being or maximum social welfare. So, low system is the rational system, and highest system is the social system. This is the way we uh, analyze, he analyzed the system complexity. Whereas interaction with the environment, your, how your biogeochemical cycling, the cycles are taking place, how your biological systems are interacting with the outer atmosphere, biotic and abiotic resources, and our, how your social organization system is uh, was doing work. This was all discussed by Kenneth Paulding. Now, the second one was your Trojan, who pioneered the discourse on the critical linkage between thermodynamics and economics by elaborating the limits that the entropy law poses on the economic process. Now, if you remember, I showed you this uh, diagram even in the previous slide, and it shows 
that the amount of economic system box the amount of economic activities how big or small they will be they will be facilitating this uh, energy cycle and uh, as you know the higher the economic requirement higher the requirement of population for different ecosystem services there will be more entropy generated there will be more low energy low grade energy thermal energy that will be released and when more thermal low grade thermal energy is there in the environment it also ensure that we have less usable energy for example if you have more ghgs in the environment it also means for example you have studied uh, that you have this ozone layer hole because of increased refrigerator ac chlorofluorocarbons in the environment have created a hole in ozone layer so more the low low grade energy your ghgs can also be considered low grade thermal energy that are of no good to to environment they are not going to produce good amount of food they are also going to reduce your food yield they are going to reduce your productivity they are also going to reduce your food security and this is how climate change will have a significant uh, constraint in human development now this is what this uh, economic system has been regulating maybe if we don't have this higher economic development system our resource requirements our dependence on uh, resources will be little less and more sustainable now this uh, very important work of george rogen was uh, gave rise to a lot of fruitful researches but and at the same time he also tried to give fourth law of uh, thermodynamics by using the same uh, diagram but uh, this was not uh, very successful and uh, this couldn't be justified with the experiments and theories that he gave and this actually gave rise to a lot of heated debate that are still ongoing in which economic relevance of the entropy law was sometimes dismissed altogether so while entropy law was is very relevant many times because of uh, george rogen how he considered it as fourth law of thermodynamics uh, there was a lot of discussion and this was also dismissed at uh, in at many discussions and debates now it is very clear that in thermodynamic view the economy uses low entropy energy it's very clear and matter from its surrounding natural environment to produce consumption goods and discard high entropy waste back into the environment and we have discussed quite a lot in previous slide neither economy nor your planet is as at large is a isolated system there are open systems and we have a quite a good amount of mass energy exchange and the third second law makes a statement about isolated system in thermodynamic equilibrium only only entropy is a, is a very important and uh, important variable in open system near and far from equilibrium to so second law makes relevance in this context and we can consider it to explain a lot of uh, our planetary problem especially related to planetary boundaries that i will be discussing so now next topic comes uh, in uh, this chapter is about characterization of various biotic and abiotic resources i am sure you all have this understanding of biotic and abiotic resources and for this biotic and abiotic resources there are two important uh, concepts stock flow resource or excludable resources and the second one is uh, non rival goods or content service that i will explain so your stock flow resources are called rival resources and what are they and why they are called rival i will talk uh so these are material stock patterns that ensure material and energy flows and these material stock patterns also regulate ecosystem services in the environment so that means financial systems lead to a uh, uh, your uh, requirement of uh, uh, natural resources and they also lead to damage so this degradation and growth is very much connected to economy and financial system so if you want to have uh, equitable growth uh, understanding that there is uh, human rights and human justice we need to ensure that we follow a very green financing channel that reduces 
pressure on ecosystem that reduces depletion of these ecosystems and ensures sustainable use and harvesting of biotic and abiotic resources. Now, when I talk about uh, these uh, uh, stock flow resources that are rival resources and non-rival are your uh, fund service. So, uh, rival resources are basically private goods. For example, your, uh, your clothes, your food, flower, typical goods that we have, and they are excludable. Whereas, uh, rival non-excludable goods are common goods. For example, common pool resources are your are uh, rival but not excludable good, excludable goods because they are they benefit a large number of uh, population. They are beneficial for a large number of human uh, well-being. For example, your mines, coal mines, and so many other mines. They give resources to a lot number of population. Your fisheries resources. They give a lot uh, amount of food and provisioning services to people. Then your forests. They provide food, fodder, timber, NTFP, etc. And then we call about uh, non-rival resources. So non-rival resources are fund service resources. So these are excludable goods are again the club goods, your private parks, cinemas, etc. Where your public goods are your fresh air, your sunshine, your news that are for improvement, so collective goods. So if you see uh, Rival resources are mostly private goods, non-rival resources are mostly club goods, but at the same time, this can be excluded, whereas non-excludable are mostly common goods and public goods. Now, fund service resources are the resources uh, that suffer from wear and tear because of production, uh, but does not become part of the thing being produced. For example, uh, there are different compartments of uh, uh, biosphere, and these are a lot of abiotic and biotic components, your rocks, your different type of soils, your different type of forest, freshwater resources and atmosphere. So they produce a lot of goods, but they are not part of the thing that is produced. So your fund service resources can be, for example, your uh, uh, shale that is produced or a soil that is an important soil for important ecosystem service. And these are the different uh, assemblages in the watershed that regulate uh, climate, water, your aesthetic and religious services, your food, your uh, timber goods, your horticulture goods. So basically fund service resources are abiotic resources, whereas your uh, stock flow services are mostly biotic resources. Now, this is a broader overview of stock flow and fund service resources. Your stock flow services are mostly these biotic resources and abiotic resources are fund flow resources where they are providing a lot of ecosystem services, but they are not part of the services that are provided. For example, your microbial interactions, they ensure fertility of soil and uh, then your uh, uh, different plant species, your organic matter, soil, uh, flora and fauna, soil pH, your sunlight, temperature, soil aeration, moisture. These are all good uh, abiotic resources and biotic resources are all these microorganisms. Some of them are provisioning services. Some of them provide you pollinator benefits. Some of them are, uh, uh, some of them are important in uh, uh, providing you different benefits of medicines, or different kind of producers that you use in your day-to-day -day life. So these are the relevance of stock flow and fund service resources. And giving you a brief overview, which are excludable and which are not excludable are here. For example, you know that your fossil fuels are basically uh, excludable services. Your minerals are uh, non-rival services, water is again context dependent. It can be a private uh, a private good also. It can be a common good also. If it is in a, if it is in a, in an ocean or it is in a river or a bigger wetland, it can be, uh, uh, it can be fund service. If uh, again, the land is, there can be a common land, common pool resources that if there can be a, a personal or private good, for example, your farmhouse or agriculture field, so that depends, it's uh, 
that depends on which category it is kept again uh, solar energy is the ultimate source of energy and it is good for biotic and both abiotic services and uh, it has again uh, a good amount of uh, low entropy energy and if it is usefully used it can be converted into good material benefit then again renewable sources of energy fish again they are stock flow energy ecosystem services are fund services waste absorption comes Uh, capacity is fund service so you you can understand it in a better way by visiting uh, uh, this diagram again uh, most of your biotic services that are private goods and club goods are your uh, rival and non rival excludable services whereas uh, fund service are uh, that are common goods and public goods are both rival and non rival but non excludable fund service Uh, so with this uh, we come to the uh, last point of this uh, chapter this unit uh, that is about absolute scarcity and sustainability and i'm showing you the example of sustainability and uh, this shows two important diagrams one is uh, planetary boundaries to show you that we have around uh, 11 11 or 12 planetary boundaries and this red mark shows that most of these uh, boundaries are not crossed for example your uh, biodiversity loss your climate change uh, and uh, there is this another nitrogen cycle so nitrogen cycle and biodiversity loss planetary uh, planetary boundaries are already crossed because we have crossed the threshold whereas climate change is still under the boundaries and uh, if we take appropriate measures in a decade we will be able to control but the way we are moving it seems that climate change boundaries will be crossed soon and so is uh, ocean acidification photosynthetic cycles and then your uh, global fresh water uses and your change in land use these are another plant uh, planetary boundaries that are being uh, affected and of course stratospheric ozone depletion at one point of time was crossed but now it is under control and if you understand a bit of uh, what are the important sustainability context this is uh, a diagram a split diagram of sustainable development goals that were split by uh, stockholm resilience center and they mentioned that your all these 17 sdgs are basically based on uh, biospheric goals so these are sdg 15 like of land sustainable goal 14 life below water six that is fresh water and sanitation and 13 that is climate action if we are able to understand and address loss of biodiversity ecosystem services loss of fresh water and ensuring climate action takes place we will be able to address and have a sustain a society that is having benefits where there is no poverty a sustainable society is zero hunger zero hunger and gender equality education for all and this this kind of society is able to have a better economic development so if you see your economy also stands on sustainability and biosphere security if we don't have our biosphere secure if we don't have sustainable societies that are resilient to climate change and changing other patterns we will not be having a uh, good economic development and if we don't have economic development we will not be having peace in the world you know that in most of the wars or uh, that have that take place across the world are basically because of uh, resource crunch or resource conflicts most of these are because of poverty or maybe because of over development that has taken place so all developed countries try to grab resources on from under developed or developing countries and at the same time push responsibilities on these countries by taking the better benefit of these worldly uh, resources so this is the scenario of uh, sustainability and how it should be understand so there is this uh, context of axiom or philosophy of material value 
and axiom of abundance now axiom is basically a a philosophical term uh, that talks about two in, four important concepts one is reality one is knowledge third is value and fourth is logic or reasoning uh, so reality is what counts as nature existence feeling what is ultimate nature of things why do we need economic development and what kind of knowledge we have how do people know what they know and axiology is more about the fundamental values the consciousness of what we are extracting and logic the habit of mind of accepting reasoning inferring arguing so the overall axiom is a philosophical concept of understanding the material values or abundance now axiom of material value says that resources will have no intrinsic value apart from their economic value in market for example everything in this world is um, valued with the market availability and at the same time if you want to understand nature nobody can actually have assess the 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 actual value of nature or natural goods and services for example you go out to have a fresh air in the park to get good health benefits or have good uh, exercising benefits nobody can give a accurate value maybe a park imposes a, a tax or a entry fees but this is a very immaterial in terms of the benefits you have in terms of good health because your good health keeps you running your good health keeps you doing the task that you are expected to do good health also keeps you doing all the responsibilities that you are expected to do with a small benefit or availing the benefit that comes from nature so that means uh, most of the resources that are in market have economic value uh, if they are not in the market they don't hold any value so at the same time we know there are so many essential functions of this uh, planet ecosystems that are very critical to economy for example the regulating ecosystem services the biogeochemical cycle if we don't have if we don't have uh, appropriate uh, running of these biogeochemical cycle for example your phosphorus cycle your carbon cycle your hydrological cycles your nitrogen cycles maybe will not have these functions as the same true for uh, soil fertility that takes hundreds of year to build the fertility of soil and if we continuously use these pesticides and herbicides we are going to deteriorate this function so the axiom at material value says that though a lot of these services of environment don't have a market but at the same time they have a very 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 important role to play in running this economy that we have axiom of abundance is the second term that says that your earth is very large in comparison to the economy that we have so large and this planet is so large that for practical purposes we have unlimited natural capital that cannot be significantly depleted or degraded by economic process and production need not be limited in the long run now there is a very different argument axiom of abundance that says that our planet has uh, unlimited resources to actually run this planet if you see this uh, axiom in depth you will understand that this also means that uh, uh if you don't have coal maybe we will have some alternative resources we will have solar or wind to run this planet so we will have certainly some resources some source of energy to run this planet so the economic uh, system should actually comprise of an insignificantly small portion of surrounding environment and therefore cannot cause its entropy to significantly increase with an economically meaningful span of time now meaningful span of time is very important it also says that uh, entropy is irrelevant to production and thus to economics so it says that uh, economic uh, entropy might not be very relevant term to use in the economics but if you see this both the concept of material value and abundance you will find that uh, economics have actually not given a very important place to nature though in last couple of decades we have started thinking about environment and these two concepts especially axiom of abundance is quite 
unrelated and not a very uh, real time uh, under give, gives not a real time understanding when the entire world is saying that our coal resources are only for next 30 to 60 years our fossil fuels will not be there after 30 to 40 years so that means that our resources are not unlimited they are limited and axiom of abundance doesn't clearly depicts the scenario of inclusion now there is this third axiom that talks about technological abundance and it says that Technology will always have this power to actually find some substitution from our natural capital to ensure that human well-being is ensured. For example, this was only technological intervention when in last few years we started saying that we can actually use uh, the greenhouse gas emission or carbon dioxide emission by using carbon capture technology we can capture this carbon back to the earth the below below the below the earth and we can actually use for some usable energy similarly we started saying that hydrogen is the biggest source of energy nuclear is the biggest source of energy so we have n number of such technologies that give us a lot of opportunities a lot of alternatives than fossil fuel and uh, your coal So this axiom also means that uh, that we can continue doing the kind of uh, economic expansion that we are doing without actually degrading environment. Because as technological interventions and discoveries will take place, uh, the entropy is, uh, uh, the entropy, again, it says that the entropy discussion is very, very irrelevant in that way. Because it says that uh, whenever there is highest entropy, the energy will be of no use. Whereas the axiom of technological abundance says that as our technology will improve, we will always find resources to run this planet. So the economy can expand to a uh, surrounding closed system as the economy creates man-made substitute for environmental function. So there is always saying that if uh, every year there is a day when we say that we have actually used the resources that were, sub, uh, that, that were uh, sufficient to actually run for a year. So, for example, every year around August or September, we actually consume what was allocated to the entire humankind for one year. But what happens is uh, we are now trying to find alternative resources. So, by technology, we are trying to find alternative resources on Mars, on Moon, but uh, this neoclassical approach uh, predicts uh, sustainability on technological capability and it can be said as weak sustainability because it doesn't talk about sustainable utilization of resources. It talks about technological interventions that can always found alternatives. But at the same time, by find, find, finding alternatives, you will actually deplete the resources that you have. So uh, in this context, we will like to submit here that ecological uh, economics will try to address not only economic development but also the absolute uh, scarcity or ecological scarcity that is taking place so how to address the concept of scarcity scarcity of resources scarcity of biological resources scarcity of so many other resources and it should be seen as a co-evolution concept of separate but interacting constraint, how economy and environment interaction takes place. Because this economy environment interaction leads to economic growth. So if there will be less resources, if we are ecological scarcity, we are not doing sustainable resource harvesting. There are times that we will limit uh, the economic growth. Now there is, uh, if you remember, there was three axioms material value, axiom of abundance, axiom of technological intervention. So the axiom of material value is basically rejected in favor of a belief that parts of the environment have intrinsic value. Whatever comes from environment and has a market as basically a market value and is an intrinsic value. And now even if you see carbon, one ton of carbon that we sequester is having a market value. That means that it has an intrinsic value. So we have this voluntary carbon market where communities can come and say that, okay, under reduced emission from deforestation and degradation, 
we have conserved this much amount of carbon. Then at the same time, markets focusing of misperceived for the scarcity may sometimes produce technologically enabling economic expansion. For example, if you remember in the starting of this year or last year, there was a sudden, uh, a sudden some small news in, uh, in media that uh, our coal resources are shrinking down. And uh, that's why not a suitable amount of coal is reaching these thermal power plants and that will reduce our uh, energy production. So at that time, government has started seeking opportunities, technological interventions to get energy supply from alternative resources. For example, right now, India gets about 61% of their uh, uh, energy from coal, but at the same time, we have around 40% coming from solar, wind, and nuclear energy, and of course, hydropower projects. So that means these technological inter interventions can help address the cause of uh, ecological scarcity. So that means uh, strong sustainability rejects the axiom of material value, abundance and technological abund abundance. So when we talk about strong sustainability context, we need to understand that we don't have to only conserve that is having a market. We have to conserve whatever is in the environment because everything has a value, may not be direct materialistic value, but definitely a non-material intangible value. And this is what we will be discussing. And for example, your provisioning services can give you food, fodder, water, food supplies, but if you don't have pollinator benefits of bees and bumblebees, maybe you will not even get food on your plate. So your provisioning services are actually dependent on your pollinating benefits. So, and that doesn't have a market. So that means uh, that your material value axiom is actually not very suitable. And at the same time, we don't have abundant resources. So your second axiom also gets rejected. And we don't support technological abundance where when scarcity happens, we actually shift to other resources. We should have instead follow an approach where your technological approach is used to ensure there is sustainable utilization of resources or finding alternative to resources that do not deplete your uh, uh, reservoirs of renewable goods, non-renewable goods and services. Now, if I want to summarize this chapter, I have certain uh, important points and takeaway points that I think we all have learned today. The first one is the biophysical economic foundation of ecological economics is very much explicit and clear with the law of thermodynamics, and we all have learned today. The first and second law of thermodynamics, and most importantly, the, the concept of entropy, understanding of biotic and bio abiotic resources, your uh, and then important reading on ecological economics, how it gets related. We also uh, got to understand how production and consumption activities are essentially transformations of matter and energy that are governed by the law of thermodynamics. And we also find a close linkage between economics and laws of thermodynamics. We also talked about policy level relevance of thermodynamics as it actually helps us to understand energy security, climate stability goals. And this is what we discussed today. We also talked about two important neoclassical, uh, uh, important economists and their concepts on environmental and resource economics. And with a clear focus on how to understand relative scarcity of environmental goods and services. And we also talked about ecological economics and it, uh, it's concerned with addressing the relevant absolute scarcities as imposed by the diverse biogeochemical, physical environment and different biogeochemical cycles. Uh, with this, we move to the unit third. And if you have any questions for this particular unit, I'm happy to answer. So I assume that you all understand what I have discussed and you will be able to actually write about this also in your examination. So now the third unit is, I'll take partially this unit and maybe we will cover it uh, in the next session. 
uh, this unit is about the ecological limits to economic growth and we know there is always limits to our economic growth we cannot we go beyond that threshold so this unit will talk about the standard model of economic growth the ecological economic view of economy human biomass appropriation climate change ozone shield rupture perspective of ecological limits alternative models of production wealth and utility so uh, there is this first thing about a finite global ecosystem related to the economic subsystem so we discuss very much in detail how solar energy enters and how heat loss happens how entropy is less how entropy increases how it to uh, provide energy and resources to different subsystems population goods produces and how waste and energy some of them gets lost while some of them gets uh, recycled by developing energy and resources that are transformed now the most useful indicator of the magnitude of our environment is basically uh, how our population per capita is using resources some of them might be having a subsistence dependence on resources more of a biomass based economy there is something called economy proper market based economy and if you remember our previous slides in one of the slides i mentioned how big uh, is this uh, central square of economy of market it actually regulates it actually facilitates how much of matter energy transformation will take place and how this uh, finite global ecosystem will actually run so that means the more our economic demands are we will need more resources we will need more matter we will need more energy there will be more entropy more randomization and there will be more wasteful energy generated back to the environment so that means that uh, we need to have a sustainable approach so that while we address human welfare we also understand resilient ecosystem we also develop resilient societies that are in harmony with nature and nature's contribution for human wellbeing now this is the scale of human economic subsystem with respect to that of global ecosystem on which it depends and this global ecosystem is source of material input now if our population increases definitely our market increases if our population increases it also requires more resources from the environment and this will lead to more issues in future now more one of the most important imperative of this discussion is to understand uh, that we can only develop within the cap within the capacity of the ecosystem if we see the historical development in gdp right from 1900 we find that uh, our human history has grown and in throughout this it took all human history to go to about 600 billion dollar per year of economy by 2000 and we are still growing and there is still a lot more people getting added to this planet with more demand and today the world economy grows by this uh, amount every year unchecked so that means uh, this about 16 trillion dollar uh, per year global economy will be five times 10 times more bigger than in one generation or so so that means there is sudden exponential growth in economics there is sudden exponential growth in market there is sudden exponential growth in population that brings a lot of population pressure it also brings a lot of population demand and this demand is for resources and its requirement now when i talk about standard model of economic growth if you remember in the previous uh, discussion that happened almost uh, two to three weeks back we talked about economic growth for what we need economic growth so uh, economic growth is required for fixed prices better environment better livelihood uh, improving per capita wealth and that is how in real time economic growth is measured and uh, this aggregate economic growth has been the principal mean for realizing these goals 
But if you see these compelling evidence, you will find that global economy is not very sustainable concept because it is consuming a lot of your environmental services. If you see right now, the biggest problem of this earth is unsustainable agriculture, agriculture intensification. That is reduced, that might be in, uh, increasing uh, your provisioning ecosystem services, increasing your food productivity, but that is coming at the cost of uh, soils regulating ecosystem services, supporting ecosystem services, and of course your cultural ecosystem services. And if it keeps going on for long, there is time when our ecosystem collapse will take place. And that's very clear around many parts of even our country, that many parts of our country are facing, ecosystems are facing hidden collapse. So that means this is a situation where we will be, it will be very tough or it is impossible to actually restore the ecosystems back to the way they are. So this economic growth uh, talks about real GDP, it talks about national income and output, uh, but what should it look like? It should look like improved living standards, improved education standards, improved healthcare infrastructure, but there is a disparity. Even if you see our country, there are certain pockets that are very well developed, and if you see certain pockets where electricity, good human well-being, healthcare, infrastructure, commute, uh, they have still not reached. So the standard model of economic growth is basically not only national growth, it is basically human well-being, the larger population, population having better services, better facilities for development. Now, uh, what do they look like? They can look like uh, affordability of household, robustness of population, education and awareness, affordability for municipality for better sanitary services, income, capacity to implement, capacity to maintain, capacity to operate, and of course, in the center of this is government coordination. Now, when I talk about benefits of economic growth and cost of economic growth, it is clear that the, there is certain cost that we play, pay for this economic growth. And the most important example is right now, many of you are aware there is inflation happening, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of the Ukraine, Russia war, or so many other reasons. So this inflation is very global. And then there are pollution, your economic growth brings pollution. It also brings congestion. You see your cities are packed. It also is a site of diseases. Your development brings a lot of diseases. Uh, your, the cost of cutting down forest and using trafficking of wild species, consumption of wild species, un unsustainable extraction of species, your land use land cover changes, they've all been the biggest driver of COVID and many such pandemics that we have seen, be it HIV or Zika or any other virus. Then of course, it also brings inequality the, the, the entire uh, system of uh, development, the entire system of uh, economic development stands on inequality. You have a poor, so poorer section and you have a richer section. So riches gets richer and poorer gets poorer. So this is how equality takes place. And even in, in India, you see a large number of population living in rural areas. Many of them are under below poverty line. So this is the cost of growth that we pay. So at the same time, we now understand that there is a very much consensus on this concept that uh, economic growth and human well-being are not two similar things. It is not a surety that economic growth will improve your human well-being. Whereas if you visualize a, a visualize a society living a few years back or hundreds of years back where there was no market, the people were not very rich and not very poor. They were more or less on similar levels. It was only when uh, during, uh, uh, when these populations and communities started living in certain sections and how they made kings and uh, their followers, that is when market also originated and that's when uh, disparity, inequality took place in the society. So that also means that standard measures of economic output such as GNP, 
the GDP does not reflect growing disparity between rich and poor in most nation, nations. And the degradation of environmental resources actually diminishes the health of people, communities, ecosystems, and also society. So you know that urban centers, while are at the center of development, they are also the center of diseases. They are also the center of so many of these issues. So that means GDP should not be the right measure of development. And then underlying this universal prescription of economic growth of theoretical models that describe the process of growth itself. Uh, so in, inherent and one of the very intrinsic approaches understanding of economic growth is that it comes on the cost of ecological exploitation or degradation. And these economic models also reflect that conventional wisdom about what drives historical growth of living standard is basically environment. Environment and natural resources are the one that are actually driving this entire process. And these models have not appropriately captured this. Initially, they have not very much captured. This is only very recently when we have started talking about the role of environment for economic growth. And in last half of the century from 1900 onwards, when industrial revolution started, when all these laws and principles were framed, environment was not the primary consideration. Development was the primary consideration. So that has also misinterpreted the role and importance and core relevance of this entire concept of ecology in human. Now, when I talk about models of feasibility of sustainability, you know, if you want to have social development, environmental protection at the same time, you need to address social, if you want to address uh, ecological really, uh, sustainability, we have to really address economic development, we also have to address social development. So for policy effectiveness also, economic effectiveness also, social, ecological, and economical context has to be in the center. Now, participation, transparency, and accountability of different stakeholders involved should be very much in the decision making. Now, much of this is based on a lot of new classical growth model that has taken place and that says that we have finite resources and examines the possibility of what will happen if we continuously just consume over a very unlimited time frame. So surprisingly, as I mentioned, uh, this will depend on three important parameters, resource sustainability, substitutability, technical progress, and population growth. Keeping population growth under check, ensuring science and technology progresses so that we have always resource substitutability and we don't have pressure on one resource and we have always have the substitute to ensure that entire consumption patterns are sustainable and within the limit. Now, it's very easy to get specific results for specific sets of assumptions, but these are of dubious validity as a guide to actual policy. Now, uh, as the, this mentioned, uh, these are not only assumptions, these are very actual thoughts, but at the same time, uh, policy planning many a time doesn't consider this approach because for policies, uh, national development is a priority. So in that way, many a times, uh, environmental protection, ecological conservation takes backseat. Now, I talk about this inclusion of environmental concerns in standard growth models as a very active area of research in environmental economics. Now, mainstreaming of biodiversity conservation, mainstreaming of environmental conservation is very important in environmental economics and policy planning because this gives you this, that gives you evidence evidence based decision making a very common perception of uh, this standard growth is that substitution and technological change can effectively decouple economic growth but at the same time this is not the real real picture this is not the reality you cannot actually uh, substitute a degraded environmental services by equivalent form of human made capital, people, machines, factories. Uh, very recently, you might have also seen somewhere in, there was a publication in Nature 
where uh, drone based pollinator services are being uh, taken as technological advancement uh, instead of bees these drone based small bees are going to pollinate uh, these food crops but in reality is it possible to actually bring them to every nook and corner of the world you are free of course services of bees and bumble bees and so many other pollinators can never be replaced by anything else and that's why there was this important slogan written somewhere ibes has also run intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services have run a very important uh, the first assessment was in 2015 on pollinator benefits what is the value of pollinator benefits and i must say one thing that these pollinator benefits are worth more than trillion of dollars every day every year and you cannot uh, substitute these benefits by any other technology because this is something that nature provides you and this has its own relevance so uh, your world sustainability in this unit has been discussed by either continuing growth or non declining consumption so that means if you want continued growth unrestricted growth economical growth that and at the same time you want to have non declining consumption you have to ensure that this growth and this consumption both of these parameters are sustainable in nature so you only harvest only extract something that is only required for your generation while you leave a large chunk of that for forthcoming generation so that your offspring your upcoming generation are not facing the same that you are facing because of inappropriate steps of ruthless exploitation and development that has been taken place in last two uh, more than hundreds and 200 of decades now if you see the technical setting there are two important parameters the technical setting and these technical and institutional condition describe what's new whether it is uh, uh, sustainably possible or not possible so if you see these uh, condition technical conditions are mix of renewable and non renewable sources the initial endowments of capital and natural resources and the ease of substitution among input so the technical conditions are understanding from where your resources are coming is it renewable or non renewable and i don't need to explain what renewable and non renewable resources are now because i'm sure you are well aware about that and the institutional settings the institutional settings mainly are based on market structure or your property uh, rights your market structure is again of uh, uh, four or five different types i will dis discuss it in the forthcoming slide and then uh, these are uh, four important structures your monopoly uh, when your market is dominated by a single uh, seller or a single unique product so it has a monopoly you have for example you have certain kind of cereals or grains that are in the market or you have a certain uh, brand in the market so that's a monopoly oligopoly when there are small number of suppliers acting collaboratively or uh, market structure is dominated by small players so that's oligopoly and then is monopolistic competition uh, and then there is a monopolistic competition market structure is such that many firms are actually offering you same kind of product that are very similar and that are similar kind of substitute and then there is the fourth market structure perfect combination is a structure in which all companies sell identified products and any company cannot determine prices now this is a more or less a situation where we live in where prices are more or less in similar ranges they can only vary if there are certain kind of improvements or certain kind of things that are being added to this combination or this competition so now uh, this substitution between economists and call capital factories machine and input from environment is a very very critical approach that indicates how much of input must be increased to maintain the same level of production because production is always dependent on what is in the reserve what is in the environment what is in the nature for example if you need a certain kind of a paper so you have to ensure that you always have constant supply of that raw material 
So if there is no constant supply of raw material, it will al always hamper the market. So large S implies that the cost impact due to rising price of one input. So whenever there is fluctuation of any raw material or any input, it always, uh, there is always rise or rise in the prices. So natural resources can be easily escaped by switching to different techniques of production that favor the use of another input, say capital cost. So you can always find different techniques and that is what technological intervention has taken place. Over the time period, technology has improved and this improvement has actually filled the gap of anything that could have uh, had a major impact on production of anything in the market. So I think uh, till this, I would like to take and I it is already now two hours uh, in case you have any questions till now or any comment or any suggestion, I would like to take it now.